Is faith a gift from God? In other words, when someone has faith, do they have that faith because God gave it to them? Did God give them the gift of faith, and that's what allowed them to believe? This is a very important question because it goes to the heart of how the gospel operates. So let's dig in. I want to start in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. So if you would turn with me, get Romans chapter 4. And we want to understand some basic things about faith. The first thing that we want to notice is this. Faith is not a work. I'll say that again. Faith is not a work. Some will teach that having faith, exercising faith, is itself a work. But let's look at what the scripture says on that. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but what? Believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That verse provides a lot of clarity. Let's look at it again. But to him that worketh not, but believeth. So the person in Romans 4, verse 5, doesn't work, he worketh not, but he believes. So is believing a work? It's not, it can't be, because the verse says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. That verse, in and of itself, right there, is sufficient to demonstrate beyond doubt that faith is not a work. And just in case you had any doubt, look at the whole verse. But to him that worketh not, but believeth, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See, that verse even tells you that what is belief the same thing as? Belief is the same thing as faith. So Romans 4, verse 5 tells you, it demonstrates it very clearly, that faith is not a work. Get Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to demonstrate this to you again. One of the things that you want to do in your Bible study is you want to compare verse with verse. If you base a doctrine on a single verse, you you realize there's risk in doing that because you might be misunderstanding that verse. But when you can find verse and verse and verse that say the same thing, they may use different words, but they stand for the same principle, you can be confident that principle is true because you have multiple evidences within the Word of God. So look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace... Are ye saved through faith? So what are you saved through? Faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, notice verse 9, not of works. Well, if the first part of the verse, of verse 8, says that you're saved through faith, and in the very same sentence it says, not of works, then faith can't be works. Isn't that obvious? For by grace are you saved through faith. So are you saved through faith? Yes, that's what it says. Are you saved through works? No, because it says not of works. So therefore, faith cannot be a work. So now we have demonstrated twice, both from Romans 4, verse 5, and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that faith is not a work. Now that is something that people commonly say. People commonly say that faith is a work, But you now have two passages that demonstrate that it is not. So now let's consider the next issue. When you ask the question, is faith a gift from God? Think about what that means. 
if faith is a gift from God and God gives someone faith, but he doesn't give someone else faith, then isn't God really choosing who's saved and who's not? I mean, so think about it. Do, do all men have faith? Well, they don't. Are there unbelievers on the earth? There are. So if faith is a gift from God, then God gave that gift to certain people who have faith, but to the people who don't have faith, he didn't give them that gift. So if you say that faith is a gift, then what you are saying is God gave the gift of faith to person A, but not person B. He gave the gift of faith to person C, but not person D, which means that God chooses A to be saved, but not B. C to be saved, but not D. Look with me at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I'll make this statement, and then we'll see if I can prove it. The gospel is a command to be obeyed. In other words, what the gospel is, is it is an instruction. It is a command. It tells the individual to do something. Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Well, look at that. What are you supposed to do when you hear the gospel? You're supposed to obey it. Well, if, you, if you're supposed to obey it, then it must be a command. So let's do an obvious contrast. When you go to the ice cream store and you pick a flavor that you want, it's not a command. It's not an obedience thing. You're just choosing. You can pick this or you can pick that. You can pick chocolate. That'd be a fine choice. You can pick cookies and cream. That'd be a fine choice. You could really mess up. You could pick cherry cordial. I mean, you can fail at the ice cream store. You realize this, right? You can make colossal errors. I'll give you another example. You could go into the supermarket and you could buy green beans. And that would be a mistake. You don't want to do that. But it's a free choice. Now, maybe you're inferring something about how I feel about green beans and cherry cordial. Maybe you are. I don't know. But my point is, there are things in life where it's not obedience. You just choose. You pick the flavor you like, to pick the vegetable you like. It's, not, it's just a matter of choice. But what does Romans 10, 16 say about the gospel? You are to obey it. Well, if you are to obey it, then it must be a command. Look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. See, we aspire on this program not only to help your Bible studies, but we want to help you think about all of life. We'll help you think about ice cream. We'll help you think about vegetables. We, we view ourselves as, as full service that way. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. The studio audience is not nearly as amused as I thought they would be. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that... Obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if they obey not the gospel, the gospel must be an instruction. The only way you can fail to obey something is it has to be an instruction. It has to be a command. It has to be a requirement. It has to be an edict, right? It's not voluntary. It's not optional. It is something that you are mandated to do. So people, unbelievers, they obey not the gospel. Look with me at Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Now, as we turn to Acts 2.38, we are turning, of course, to the early part of the book of Acts. And we're looking at information that is relevant under the kingdom program. So this is not something that is instructions for today. We understand that. But that doesn't mean we can't learn something from it. Look with me at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, 
every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What Peter is doing there is he's preaching to them the gospel of the kingdom, just as John the Baptist preached a water baptism based upon repentance. What did Peter preach in Acts 2.38? Repent and be baptized. Now, as you look at Acts 2.38, as you look at that sentence, what is the subject of the sentence? What is the subject of the sentence in Acts 2.38? Well, when it says, repent and be baptized, it's the same thing as shut the door. Be quiet. Stop talking. In other words, it's the understood you. So like if you just take the simple phrase, shut the door, or stop talking. In stop talking, there's, there's no subject in that sentence. The subject is the understood you, the recipient of the command, the person that's being spoken to. Well, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Peter is saying to his audience, I am instructing you to do this, to repent and be baptized. Again, it's an instruction. It's a command. And the hearers were expected to obey. Look with me at Acts 16. Now, Acts 2.38 is is prior to the dispensation of grace. It's not for us, but we can nonetheless learn something about how the gospel of the kingdom operated. Notice what Paul preaches to the Philippian jailer. Acts 16, verse 30, and this clearly is instruction for today. Acts 16, verse 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Friends, that is the question of this life, right? The question of this life is not how to make more money. The question of this life is not what is the secret to long health and vitality. The the basic question to this life is how do I get to heaven and avoid the lake of fire? You, you, You cannot get that question wrong. Well, notice the answer. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. What, do they, what does Paul say to the Philippian jailer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an instruction. It's a command. What do I have to do to be saved? What you have to do is you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about what we've seen. We went to Romans 10, and we went to 2 Thessalonians 1, and in both of those passages, it explicitly says that you have to obey the gospel. It's a command. It's a requirement. It's an instruction. In Romans, or excuse me, in in Acts 2.38, when Peter preaches the gospel of the kingdom to his listeners, he's not giving them, hey, here's an option. Here's something that's an interesting idea. Consider it. That's not what he's saying. What they needed to do, without exception, there was no other solution as they needed to repent. They needed to have a change of mind. In Acts 16... When the Philippian jailer asks the right question, what must I do to be saved? He has to believe. So what does this all tell you? The way that the gospel works is the gospel commands man to do something. It doesn't, now now think about this. If, If God says to you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, and yet he doesn't give you faith? Do you realize how cruel that is? I mean, think about this. I mean, this is an appropriate example, and it's cruel, but I I think it's appropriate, or it's, it's, it's at least accurate. What if there's a man who's paralyzed, and he's sitting in his wheelchair, and you say to him, stand up and walk. Stand up, you lazy person, and walk. Well, that would be a cruel thing to say, right? I mean, the person is, he can't. He doesn't have the ability to because he's paralyzed. So for you to say to that person, stand up and walk, when they can't do that, is incredibly cruel. Well, now think about the gospel for a minute. If faith is a gift, in other words, if you have to have God give you faith to be saved... 
and he doesn't give it to everyone, then what happens when you say to someone that doesn't have faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? You're commanding that person to do something they have no ability to do if faith is a gift. What all that tells you is faith is not a gift from God. Every human being, every single one, has the ability to exercise faith. If I look at someone and I say, stop talking, or sit down, or be quiet, every person I'm looking at has the ability to stop talking, right? I mean, they could choose not to. They may not choose to do that, but do they have the ability to do that? Yes. Well, when Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the fact that he tells people to do that means that they all have the capability to do that. If they didn't have the capability to do that, he wouldn't have said it. It wouldn't have made any sense. It wouldn't have been fair. Look with me at Revelation 22. So what we've seen is faith is, it's not a gift from God. Faith is an act of man's free will. When Paul said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what he was doing is he was saying, Philippian jailer, it's up to you. You can choose to believe. You can choose not to believe, but you know who's making the choice? You. Do you have the ability to choose? You do. And you get to pick which route you go. Look with me at Revelation 22, 17. This is near the last verse in the Bible. I, I love this verse, and, and it's, it's just a beautiful verse, and I think it captures God's heart toward lost man. Look with me at Revelation 22, verse 7. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. In other words, here's what's happening. What do the Spirit and Bride say? Come. It's an invitation. We, we welcome you. We want you to be here. Come. And let him that heareth say, come. The, the person that hears, they should respond to that invitation. The loving, gracious invitation of the Spirit should not be resisted. It should be enthusiastically received. You want me to come to faith? You want me to come and take the water of life freely? Yes, I will. And let him that is a thirst come. You see what that's saying? What that's saying is, if you have a spiritual need, if you thirst for salvation, if you thirst for God's blessing, it doesn't say, what can you offer me? It doesn't say, what can you give me? What does it say? Come in. You're welcome. And then notice the last part of the verse. And whosoever will, anyone who wants it, it's available to everyone. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life. And what's the last beautiful word? Freely. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to meet my conditions. You don't have to accomplish a performance standard. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's how the gospel works. The gospel is made available to all men. It's an invitation to accept it. It's available. And it's free. The person who determines whether someone is saved is the person themselves. It's not that God picked this person to be saved and that person not to be. The individual person decides. Let me prove that to you further. Get 1 Timothy 2. 
You know how I know that God doesn't pick certain people to be saved? You know how I know that you don't get saved because faith is a gift from God? 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4. Who will? So here's God's will. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So according to that verse, what is God's will for mankind? He wants mankind to be saved. What percentage of mankind does God want to save? 100%. He wants all men to be saved. Now, you know what that tells me? See, what that demonstrates is this. It's not God who decides who gets saved. Because if God decided who got saved, what percentage of the people would be saved? 100%. All men would be saved. But instead, what God did is this. God made the provision for men to be saved. God the Son died on the cross for man's sin. When he shed his blood, he provided the full, complete, and perfect payment for sin. By doing that, God made salvation available to all. But the person who chooses whether or not they actually have it is the individual. See, if God was choosing, he, he wants all men to be saved. That's what 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 says. But what happens is the individual person decides whether they believe. That's why Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He was saying to the Philippian jailer, The ball is in your court. I've told you what the gospel is. The gospel is Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. If you believe that, God will save you eternally in a moment. And if you reject that, you're in your sins. So please, please, please believe it. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, 2 Pe Peter chapter 3 is obviously a writing by Peter. It is a writing to the kingdom church. It is not a writing to the body of Christ, but we're going to see something very similar. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many men does God want to perish? None. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants all men to come to repentance. Think about this example with me. When when people are confined to the lake of fire for all eternity and they're, they're cast into it and they have, they have no hope of escape, they're going to be there forever. Does God do that with joy? Does he do that with glee? Does he... I mean, you, you realize he's pained at that. Those people are cast into the lake of fire because the justice of a holy God requires that the wicked be judged for their wicked deeds. God's holiness, his righteousness, his justice requires him to be a fair judge, and therefore the wicked must be punished. He doesn't do that with joy. He doesn't do that with glee. He's not happy about that. He hates that. And you know he hates that because multiple verses have just told us that God wants all men to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. What he did is when Jesus Christ died on the cross, according to 1 Timothy 2 verse 6, he gave himself a ransom for all. 
God took the collective sins of humanity throughout time, all of them, that multitude of wickedness, made his son sin on behalf of man, poured out his wrath on his son because he wanted to provide the opportunity, the availability of salvation for all of mankind. And Jesus Christ fully accomplished that. So does God deserve all the credit for everyone who's ever saved? Yes, he does. God deserves 100% of the credit. But who is it that chooses where they end up for all eternity? It's not God. It's the individual person. Because the individual person decides whether or not they believe the gospel. Now, hopefully you see what, a, what an incredibly sobering circumstance in which we find ourselves. See, here's the fact of the matter, and, and anyone that ever hears this, here's the reality of it. If you don't believe the gospel, if you die without having placed your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and of course, if you're held accountable, then what's going to happen at the great white throne is you're going to show up there. And you're going to be judged for your sins. And you're going to be found guilty of every wicked thing you've ever done. And, by the way, if, if you're there, you must have not obeyed the gospel. So you committed the sin of rejecting the gospel. And what happens is there is no hope. And that person is cast into the lake of fire. So let's return to our original question and we'll sum up. Is faith a gift from God? No, faith is not a gift from God. Faith is not a work. Faith is not a gift from God. What faith is, is faith is the individual's choice. The gospel is preached to all mankind because God wants to save all mankind. But the individual person decides whether or not they believe. If you haven't done that yet, you need to do that immediately, if not sooner. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Romans 3.25 describes salvation as faith in his blood. What you do is you quit trusting in your righteousness. You quit trusting in your goodness, your religious acts, your tithing, your church membership, your good deeds, and you trust solely in what Christ did for you on the cross. The moment that you do that, you're eternally saved. That's the message the world needs to hear. That's the message that we need to tell them. That's the answer for a lost and dying world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for everything that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Praise be to his name.